athletes. Although they, God knows they've got enough money if they put their mind to it. But, but the older machines are more likely to be compatible because they've been around longer and, and tested and, uh, and the updates work on those. So, so I don't know, it's always, it's always this updating business, it, it's, I think it's always gonna be an issue from time to time. Um, so where, I don't know where the sweet spot is on what vintage machine is gonna be, is gonna give you the least uh, uh, problems in doing these Windows updates, I have no clue. All I know is mine is about, I don't know, I think it's about three years old. And uh, I haven't had any issue with any of the Windows updates so far. And uh, I, I've not, been pretty lucky myself. Uh, that's not to say I won't have, but. Yeah. So any, anyway, the, the reason I brought this article up is because if you're having issues, you might want to take, take a look and read down through all the descriptions and see if something might apply to your situation, to your machine, um, and your version of Windows 10. Okay, any more questions, any more comments about that? Because it, it, it's um, something that I think we all need to pay attention to from time to time. And, uh, and maybe more often than that, maybe more often than I do. I, 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 will, I adhere to the old, uh, school of if it ain't broke don't fix it <laughs> and so the only time i would go looking for stuff like this is if i was having a problem and as i said i had a newer machine that i was trying to fix for somebody and it turned out that this it was something to do with one of the windows updates and the ver and the version of the bios in that machine and uh, so I'm, anyway i got it resolved and uh and the the uh, machine is back in the customer's hands and they're happy again for, for the time being anyway. So let's move on to something a little less, um, a little less intense. As you know, I try to put in things that are kind of unusual and funny and so forth. And uh, so my next link here is, uh, this is about a, a, a gadget I saw, which is kind of interesting. This is a combination houseboat, fishing boat, bicycle <laughs> that somebody put together. I don't really know if they're for sale. They might be. They got a name, a Z Triton. Um, it's an amphibious tricycle camper that allows you to travel over land and water. And uh, I just thought it was kind of, you know, something different. Something different to look at. And uh, you can see to travel over land, I guess you have to pedal the bicycle. Um, it's got to be heavy, so your legs got to be in good shape. If they're not, if you keep pedaling, they soon will be. And, uh, and I thought it was, you know, I always admire people that can invent something like this and put it together and sort of make it work. Even if it doesn't, this doesn't look real fast. It doesn't look real slow. It just looks like it's half fast. <laughs> but yeah, if it works, it works, you know, and uh, it kept somebody busy to where they're not out shooting people and so forth. So I guess it's a good thing. Let's move on to something else here. Oh, this was an article that a link that Barry sent me a while back and I forgot to, I was going to talk about it last time I presented and I kind of forgot about it. This is an accidental discovery that they think is going to lead to a cure for Parkinson's disease. Very nice. So far they said it leads to a, a it cures Parkinson's in mice. Now I don't know how you test a mouse for Parkinson's disease but but I don't know. I leave that to the experts. I okay, have no, no idea. The, the, the way they do that is they, th th there's companies, laboratories that raise mice with all kinds of genetic defects. Yeah. So they, okay. they right. introduce Parkinson's in a, a mouse genetically and uh, then they mess around with them. That's how they do it. It makes me kind of glad I'm not a mouse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> at least a mouse in a laboratory anyway. So if that 
if that is of concern to you, you might want to read the article and uh, and see. I found something in my own case one time. I had I was having severe uh, neck and back pain that I was told by uh, a chiropractor and an orthopedic guy who did an MRI. It was probably a result of a couple car accidents I was in when I was 19 and 20 years old. It compromised the, the, um, the disc between a couple vertebrae in my neck. And I did a lot of research uh, online rather than uh, submit to um, some doctor carving into the back of my neck and trying to fix it. Uh, and I was about ready to do that when I found, in my case, I found a couple solutions that have really helped me. They wouldn't help everybody, but it's worth, it's worth uh, researching and invest, investigating this stuff online, I think, because there's so much going on out there that your doctor, your specific doctor, might not be aware of, an, uh, of, a, of a remedy or a cure or a fix for you that would be more to your liking than what he's offering. It's kind of like the old adage, you know, if you, if you give a guy with a hammer a wood screw, he can put it into the wood, but he's not going to screw it in the way it's meant to be, and it's not going to hold as well, because he's going to use what he knows how to do, and that's a hammer. So at one point, I went to an orthopedic surgeon, and they did an MRI on my neck, and he told me, oh man, he said, you've got really big problems here. And he showed me the MRI and he says, we'll have to go in here and fuse these two vertebrae together. And then up above there, there's two others. We're gonna to have to fuse those together too. And this was a guy, he was a young doctor. He was maybe he looked like he was in his mid thirties. <clears throat> this was a while ago. I was probably in my mid fifties then. And, uh, he, uh, I said, well, there's got to be something else. He said, oh, he said, I can send you to physical therapy. He said, but what for, with what I'm seeing on your MRI, I guarantee that within six weeks, you'll be back in here begging me on your knees to do this surgery. Well, that was about 20 years ago. <laughs> so far, I haven't been back to see him. I found a couple other things that worked, and I found him by doing a lot of online research. And a lot of the research was stuff that when I asked my doctor about it, he'd never heard of it. I found a doctor in Syracuse that was actually using a substance called hydrogel that they do use in patients these days. They use them in their knees to build up the cushion that your cartilage normally would have. Rather than do a knee replacement, they insert this little wafer of dehydrated hydrogel and your body heat and fluids make it expand and then you get relief that way. So I found a doctor in Syracuse who was experimenting with that, trying to get approval through the um, proper authorities to do that in your neck. Well, I never had that done. That still involves surgery. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a devout coward when it comes to surgery. And so anyway, I'm just, the message is, you know, stuff like this, I put it up here. If you think, if you think it might benefit you, I read through the article and uh, read about the test and see what you think. And I, I'm a big advocate of making your own decision about your own body. Now, I've had a couple of doctors that I've had over the years that don't agree. They didn't agree with my assessment of, my, of what was going on in my body. And I have to tell, tell you, sometimes they were right. Sometimes I was right. That's the nature, that's the nature of this. And so anyway, that's why I put that, that's why I put that information up there. I thought it was nice of Barry to keep everybody in mind and forward that to me and, and so forth. So if there's no questions about that, I'll move on to the next little subject here. Um, oh, with the can with the, all the uh, social distancing and everything, uh, a lot of people are buying RVs. You know, I read, I saw on TV, some of the big RV dealers here in Michigan are out of a uh, product. They, they, they're selling out so fast because people want to get out and about. They want to do things and uh, they don't want to just uh, stay at home and uh, sit in front of the TV or sit and read and, and just not do anything. 
So I found this gadget. Some of you may like this. Some of us probably wouldn't be able to afford it. And that includes me, but it looked like it was a lot of fun. This is a device you use in the water. It's called the Sea Breacher. And uh, I'm gonna try and play this uh, video. Uh, this thing you drive, it goes underwater a couple feet and it's got room actually for two people. There you can see a picture of the guy driving it and, and his passenger. And uh, you, can, you can actually, it'll actually launch itself up out of the water a foot or so. So you can make like a dolphin and, uh, and do that. And I, I thought I had a video here. I think this is just a slideshow uh, showing it. Um, here you can see one guy really launching it up. And, uh, and there it is. So um, you could, you could, um, you can get into one of these. Uh, you, you might have to uh, 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 remortgage your house to afford it because they're pretty pricey. Um, but they have a gas engine. I think it actually it might run on propane, but they have an internal combustion engine of some sort that it runs on. And so it's got, you can't go too far below the surface because you cut off the air intake and, and it won't run so well that way. And, uh, and that, so, you know, if you want something exciting, you know, I used to tell people, I was a motorcycle rider for years and every once in a while somebody would ask me, well, why do you ride a motorcycle? I said, well, I don't know. I said, somebody one time, a buddy of mine said, I should put something exciting between my legs. And so that's what I did. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, let's see what else I got here. I'm gonna try and play this video. I had troubles doing it the last time the sound wasn't coming through. So let's give it a try. This is a guy, <laughs> again, he's looking for something to occupy some time, I think. But uh, if I can get it to go here. Um, it's called the carrot clarinet and uh, the video shows him can everybody hear that yeah okay this was a TED talk in Sydney so I'll, I'll just let it play you want to increase the volume uh, <coughs> Trying to find it here. <coughs> I'm at 100% there. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, a really good um, definition that I like of creativity is the putting together of two previously unrelated things, could be objects or ideas, and creating something new. So I'm going to take a carrot and a saxophone mouthpiece, and I'm going to give you a very quick demonstration on how to make your own instrument because I think the thing we forget is we tend it's crazy because music is such a communal activity but we tend to leave music in the hands of the experts and we and all of us consume music but you yourselves can become carrot clarinet players very easily <coughs> so you need a kitchen knife I'm going to cut off the end of the carrot and I do have my trusty Carrot clarinet measuring stick here, which is giving me all my measurements. But um, you can actually go to YouTube. I put all the measurements up on YouTube. You just need to type in "make your own carrot clarinet." So there's my um, markings for six finger holes down the front. So I'm just using the tip of this 12 millimeter bit. So I'm giving you some. You don't even have to go to YouTube. So you've got just remember that you can. You can make a mark in your app. Okay, so that's six finger holes and one thumb hole on the back marking. Okay, now the tricky part. Okay, here we go. I've got a, a bowl here so I don't make too much of a mess at this stage. And into the center.
Sip a little bit now. So that's for the finger holes, let's do the thumb hole first. And now the six finger holes that you notice that I've marked. So um, you do need, I'm actually using a saxophone mouthpiece I mentioned, but it still is a clarinet because it's a cylindrical board, not conical. Okay, well, anyway, I, I started that up when I first looked at it, and I thought, wow, geez, if I could play a clarinet, maybe I would do that. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, next subject again, not, not much to do with computers, except I, I use the um, camera feature in Windows 10. Um, this is a gadget that I bought a while back. And uh, it's, it's actually, it's a microscope, you know, it's 20 bucks. It claimed it was 50 X to 500 X handheld multi USB digital microscope with LED illumination for PC and Android. So, for 20 bucks, I thought, hey, you know, give it a try, give it a shot. I'm, I'm always I, I'm always up for trying gadgets as long as they don't cost me $2,000 just to try them. For 20 bucks, I've been known to try almost anything. So, I bought one of those for my granddaughter, and uh, the, the, the 500X is kind of a misnomer. <laughs> Yeah, well, it probably is. I think, yeah. I think what uh, the way they do that is to use a blow up on your TV, uh, on your monitor. You know, you can, can expand the picture. Maybe that's what they mean. No, I Notice. don't. Well, I don't know. But um, let me see if I can find. I've got some pictures that I took with it. Um, so. Um, the, the problem is that at 500 X, your depth of field isn't very big. That's true. And you the, have problem to I had, close. the problem I had was getting it focused and holding it steady enough yeah. to actually take a picture. The little stand helped a lot. I finally figured yeah. out if I put it, set it up just right and set the, the little dial on the side, set that at a certain place, and then just kind of move things around very slow, very incrementally, that um, it worked out uh, fairly well. And let's see if I can find my pictures here. Uh, 
There is a Anna, there's a website and it's I think they made it in China. There's a whole bunch of microscopes at various cost levels, and they have a built-in uh, USB camera. Yeah. And, and the combination of your laptop and this device uh, is uh, is uh, intriguing. And some of them actually, instead of having that, they have an actual small screen. Yeah. And and uh, you can use that. Okay, I gotta find. Uh, let's see here. What what side is this on? Oh gosh, uh, I don't where I where I bought it from. Yeah. Can't say as I remember. Was that in China? No, it no. Was, I think it probably I think was Amazon made in China. Will have these. It probably was made in China. So. Oh yeah. yeah. Made. Now, the reason right. I mentioned, I I ordered some solar. Uh, lights in late March and they're held up. Oh. <laughs> um, I, it's a, the last thing I got says I'll get them August 25th. Wanted to put them in the garden. There won't be as much light. The garden will be harvested. But uh, yeah, because of uh, ongoings with China. There are also for about a hundred dollars. There is USB cameras. If you have a no, a regular microscope, you can ten the ten X piece for the eyepiece ten X. You mm. put the the uh, USB camera in there, and then you've got a you can put your pictures on display and 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 record them. You know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which is uh, kind of neat. If you have you know high school students or whatever, or if you have the hobby. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. This is some. This is some photos I took with this uh, microscope. Just using the Windows. Plug it in the USB port. Go to go to the Windows 10 camera, and get it focused. Like I said, I had to juggle things around. Uh, this image right here. It says blue striped shirt. That was like an Oxford. An Oxford cloth shirt that I had on. It was blue and white. Um, this, this was, uh, probably a picture of the blue jeans I had on that day. Here's a close up, very close, very good close up of a newspaper photo. You can see the individual little colors around the pixels there that, that was part of the original photo. This AR that's it there, that's, that's a newsprint. Not blown up that big. That's a regular newsprint font that you would read like in the middle of an article. This one over here was actually my thumb. A small part of it, probably. And uh, this one right here was a US penny. Um, this one over here was another coin. I think it was a quarter or a nickel or something. A quarter. Just the letter P in one of the messages on the quarter. Uh, here, oh, here's another, here's a letter from a nickel. And uh, a liberty penny. That's the B from the word liberty. You can see this penny's been built up. You can see the dents in the, in the letter B. And uh, these other pictures, uh, I don't remember. I was just this. Oh, this this one was actually the surface of my laptop, the smooth plastic where my keyboard is. And this one, <laughs> I was trying to remember what it was. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't remember anymore. I did this a, quite a while ago. So anyway, that's an idea of how close you can get with this little twenty dollar microscope. I don't know. Once once I did this, you know, my wife asked the all important question. Now, what are you going to do with it? And I said, Well, I think I've just done it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but Don, I mean, you you have the you have to have a piece of software in order to 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 display the images on your laptop. What did you use? Actually, the software that came with it, I couldn't make it work very well. This was just using the camera. The, the Windows 10 camera feature. Okay. 
it came up on the camera and, and I, I thought, oh, wow, that looks pretty, you know, it looks pretty clear and everything for, for what I'm doing as close as it is. And okay. uh, the images are, are illuminated pretty well because it has a little light inside it that lights up so you don't block out all your light by holding it too close. Right. And uh, so the software that came with it <laughs> was pretty crappy. I, 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 I installed it and I tried using it. I couldn't get it to save a picture for a while. And then I got, and then I said, well, I want, I just opened up the camera feature on Windows 10. And, uh, and I have that because the camera that you're seeing me on was, was a built-in camera. And this, uh, when I plug this in, it let me choose this camera. So uh, I was able to take these, these pictures were all taken that way, not with their software, which was not good, not good software. Hey, Don, I'm looking out on uh, wish.com and it's down to 13 bucks. Oh man, I got ripped off. Well, <laughs> it, oh, maybe, maybe not. The, the catch is you might not get it for six months. Well, that's a possibility. Between war with China and the postal system, but uh, yeah, anyway, it's yeah. out there. So anyway, that's you know, with this, with being with being quarantined and in in staying in the house, you get bored, and this is what you wind up with. Mm -hmm. So, and, oh, and if anybody wants to borrow it, it's not being used currently. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'd, I'd loan it out to somebody if you want to borrow it and take some extreme close-ups of something. Fifteen dollars uh, an hour, right? <laughs> well, I, well I, I could work with that. Okay. I, I, I could work with that. Yeah. Well done. Well done. You've helped me, uh, it's Scott, uh, because I bought one of those from someplace years ago, uh -huh. and and I never could get it to work with the software that came on the you know the little mini disc that uh, yep. that came with it. Yep, that's what so, I had. Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna drag mine out and and uh, see if uh, if I can get it to run under Windows 10. Yeah, yeah. If you plug it in and just uh, you can go down to the bottom and click on the um, the Windows button. Yeah. And just type camera, and that's how I found the camera, the built-in camera, and it. I didn't really have to do too much uh, goof dinking around with it to get it to work. I, the images start coming up right away. The original problem I had was I didn't have the I didn't have that little microscope focused properly, and so all I saw was like light, you know, like light shadows moving around, because it's not it's not look it's not like for looking at the moon or anything like that. You have to remember, you have to look at something within a a fraction of an inch of the end of the uh, instrument. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I, and and uh, there's also a, a an app at least on the iPhone called Mag Light M A G. Yeah. light that does the same thing so i have the app i have the same a similar app on my android phone it's mm -hmm. called magnifier and it's pretty handy if you want a close-up of something it, and my app it automatically turns your light your led light on, on on your phone so that even though you're blocking out most of the light because you're close to something it, it illuminates fairly well that way yep um uh, okay we got by the way, if you go out, if you go out to Wish, there's also a endoscope, USB endoscope that you can, okay. I don't know, stick in holes in your walls. That's four seventy nine. Oh, oh, I thought it was like an endoscope is like what you put down your throat to check for ulcers and stuff. Oh, well, I guess you could, <laughs> I'm not but gonna, it, I'm probably you not going to do that. <laughs> you might choke on it. it yeah. <laughs> you might intubate yourself. Yeah, you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you guys out there, you know, a lot of times you have things that we consider woman's work, and sometimes you consider it man's work, depending on what it is. If it's changing the oil on, the, on my car, adjusting the brakes, my wife actually took a class on how to do brakes on cars a years ago, so she probably could have, she probably could, if she wanted to, figure out how to do that. But changing the oil stuff, that's man's work. One of the things that kind of is in overlap is carving a turkey. How many of you have been called upon to carve a turkey at Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah. I, I showed, I tried to show my wife how to do it one time and she handed me the knife. She said, don't give it back. So it's your job from now on. So my job became carving a turkey. So 
you know, you want, you want to have, I've always been one, I want the proper tools for doing a job, any job. I want to have the proper equipment so that I can do a, just a bang up job on it. So I found this carving tool that, uh, that looked kind of interesting. Oh, Jesus. What? It's, uh, they say it'll carve through just about anything. <laughs> And uh, I don't know, I forgot, I don't know if the price is on here. Oh yeah, $69. So I don't know, I don't carve turkeys that often anymore. And so I, I think I'm probably just gonna stick with my standard electric carving knife that we've had for 40 years and, and live with that. But this kind of intrigued me, you know? I mean, if I had a little extra money, I might, I might go for this. I mean, it looks, it looks pretty awesome to me. And, uh, it looks like it's actually available. Uh, where is it made? Oh, it's probably made in China, like most of the other stuff we come across. And so this that was uh, a site called mightycarver.com and they, they have a way that you can add it to your cart and you can buy it directly from them. So you don't have to mess around with eBay. You don't have to mess around with Amazon. You get you know, uh, direct with the supplier. Is it, is it made by Binford and endorsed by Tim the Tool Man? <laughs> it might be. It might be. If it's not, it should be. Yes. Um, oh, okay. I skipped over one here. This is a site. I think I talked about this before. If you're stuck watching TV and, and you're a movie watcher, we've talked about a site where you can watch live TV. You know, it's called USTVGo.TV or something like that. There's several of those sites that take this. This one is just movies only. And uh, so far, um, I've been able to watch a lot of fairly recent movies. And uh, you just click on them and they start streaming. You can do, uh, oh, and you can pick TV shows here if you would rather watch TV shows. Um, and some oh, up here that you can pick the genre of what you might want to watch. Uh, you can pick the country. So you might want to watch, uh, you know, uh, movies in German or Italian or French. And uh, they have movies and TV shows. And this top IMDb, this IMDb, uh, that's like independent movie makers, I think. And, and these are uh, in the category where you got to be pretty damn bored to be interested in some of these movies because they're pretty bad, most of them. But I guess it's in the category of better than nothing. Uh, but in the genre, you can pick, um, let's see, um, how about uh, war movies? Now, let me get back here and pick war movies. And uh, here's your selection of movies that, that have a war as a theme. And uh, are there commercials with this? Uh, no, I haven't seen any commercials. It plays the movie from beginning to end. I have had a couple mm. movies that for some reason on my on one of my computers, the movie stops every once in a while. And if you just click the progress line just to the right of the dot that it, where it stops at, It'll, it'll pick up again and then it'll play for a while. Uh, or you can back up, you can back up by 10 seconds or so and then let it play again. Sometimes that works. So that is a little bit of annoying, but some of the movies play right through without a problem. And, and I don't know if it's a problem with the movies or the streaming service or just a quirk in my PC these days. Uh, I, I haven't really figured out for sure. But hmm. uh, they've got a pretty good selection um, this is just war movies, and then they've got more pages. If I click this button here, that takes me to the last page. And so you can see it's got 21 pages of movies like this. Some of them are old, some of them are fairly recent. Some of them I've never heard of. Some of them are old classics, like this one on the left here, Run Silent, Run Deep, with mm -hmm. Clark Gable and Burt Lancaster, black and white. 
movie about uh, a submarine and a destroyer or something. I, I forget the exact uh, plot, but um, so anyway, um, for your entertainment purposes, um, this I find to be fairly easy and fairly reliable and a pretty good selection of movies. And with this tab here, you can pick uh, the different categories, the different genre of movie. If you like, uh, let's say comedies, let me click there and you can see uh, this is a sample of some of the movies. And again, there's probably multiple pages. You can see there's some like this one, this one right here, it's called My Cousin from Warsaw. Looks like a black and white movie. I'm guessing it was, might have been made in the 40s. So it's not necessarily brand new movies. It's, uh, but some fairly recent, you know, first run movies, you know, you're not supposed to watch them even if you can, I guess. It's, there are certain people out there that would frown upon that. And so uh, uh, I like the older movies myself anyway. And many of these, you know, if they're made in the 40s, the 30s and 40s and 50s, they bypass their copyright. There's a limitation on stuff you copyright. And that's, that's expired on a lot of these. So you're not violating any rules or breaking any laws or doing anything uh, um, bad to, to watch these. I don't think you are anyway, but uh, that's up to you. But anyway, it's there. And uh, they have a TV shows. These are probably these are older TV shows, of course, because they've they've they're old recordings. Um, some of them I've heard of. Some of them I've never heard of. Uh, and uh, something like this Marvel Ant Man. I, I I believe that's a fairly recent movie. Um, so those are available for your viewing pleasure. And, uh, okay. I want to talk about this speed test business. We all, you probably all know about it, right? Mm -hmm. You go to a website called speedtest.net. It comes up fairly quick and you can click on the go button. And uh, it does this little like a tachometer or speedometer. And you can see it's anywhere from zero to 100. Well, this is pegged at 100, but you can see the number climbing up. That's because we actually have a pretty good connection at the OPC these days, because that's where I'm connected to. I'm not at home. That's where I'm connected. If you want to see the dial that goes up past 100, there's a way to do that. You can, uh, everybody know how to install apps from the Microsoft Store? Yeah. yeah, no, yes, no. Well, if you go to the Microsoft Store, there's a speed test app that you can install. And rather than run this from the website, I found a difference here. And I found this because I was checking at home because I recently did some changes to my TV and internet service. Um, I guess, I guess I don't mind sounding foolish when I tell you that for, for quite a while we were, we have wow TV and internet. I eliminated the 20 bucks for the phone a long time ago, uh, because I put in a magic jack and then we got cell phones that work better. So, uh, I disconnected their phone service and I used the magic jack once in a while, but no, mostly I use my cell phone like a lot of us. So. I upgraded, I, I, I pulled the plug on WOW TV, but I hung on to WOW internet. And so the people that were, that I was talking to on the phone, they said, I said, you know, my internet services, I said, it's just kind of so-so. I said, I don't have any major problems, but the downloads are sometimes a little slower than I would like. And he said, oh, well, we've got this promotion going on. Right now, uh, you should be getting like uh, 10, 10 megabit service or 10 meg service. And, and, uh, and he said, when we disconnect your TV, that internet service, it, it's gonna cost you $67 a month with taxes and everything. And the price of the modem, you know, the, the rental on the modem. 
So I said, well, so I said, well, he said, we can, we can upgrade you to a hundred meg. And he said, because that's a new service, you qualify for the introductory rate. So we can give you hundred meg service for 40 bucks a month instead of 60 bucks a month. I say, hey, might as well. So, okay. So, but they said, the modem that you're using now won't support that. So we'll have to replace it. I said, well, I was planning on buying my own anyway. So I looked online at the modems. I wasn't sure which one I wanted to buy. So I used my local um, TV voodoo expert, Barry Parker. And I called him and I said, well, what are you doing for a modem? I said, you, have, you put your own modem in. Because he's always talking about this DOCSIS 3.1. If you get a modem, it has to be DOCSIS 3.1. Well, WOW says it had to be at least DOCSIS 3.0. But when I started looking, I listened to what Barry said, and I, he told me what, what uh, brand and model of modem he had. I bought the same one. So it's a DOCSIS 3.1 made by Aris, spelled A-R-R-I-S. So... Wow scheduled a, uh, an appointment, a call-in. They were going to call me at a certain time. So I get the new modem. I got everything in place. I got, you know, I'm ready to, I'm ready to rock and roll here. And uh, they don't call. So I waited about 45 minutes or so. So I called them. So now when I call in, I get somebody. You don't know who. Uh, you you got to go through the little prompts and hit the right button and so forth. But I get to talking to somebody, a real nice guy. And I said, well, somebody was supposed to call me to up, upgrade my internet service, my internet speed to 100 meg. He's, oh, I can help you with that. He says, right now. He says, I can do it from right here. I don't, you don't need to talk to anybody else. I said, okay. <clears throat> I said, so I got my new uh, modem that I want to use. He said, okay, he said, have you moved the cable over yet? And I said, no, I was waiting for it to coordinate with you guys. So he had me move the little coax over. I plug it in, turn the modem over. He wants the, uh, there's a, a number on the modem, on all modems called a, a MAC address. It's a 12 character, hex, hexadecimal character, 12 characters long. Every network device in the world has a MAC address on it. So he had me read that number to him and he connected up and in about 10 minutes, he had me on the internet and he said, oh, by the way, he said, you know, for the same price that we were going to charge you for the 100 meg, he said, I can make it 500 meg. I said, wow. And it's a promotional rate. I understand that. It's going to expire <clears throat> probably in six months and it's going to go up. And then I'll see what it is and then I'll do what I have to do to make it a little more to my liking one way or the other. I'll either live with it or try to find another solution. So anyway, we went through all that and I plugged in. So I plugged my laptop directly into the modem. Instead of going through my network with, which has a couple switches and cables and stuff throughout the house <clears throat> and, a, and a router with Wi-Fi on it, I plugged directly into the modem. So the first thing I did you know, when I ran this speedtest.net, I said, well, it doesn't tell me too much. It came up with a big number, like this 238 that you see here. And uh, so, okay, well, at my house, it didn't go that high. At my house, it went up to around 100, which was still a lot better than what I had. Not complaining. But in the process, I downloaded the app, the speedtest.net site, as an app that you can install and run directly from your Windows machine. And so I installed that. And, uh, and there it is on my menu right there, speed test. So I'm gonna launch that. You can see the window's a little bit smaller, it looks a little different. As soon as I launch this, you'll notice the difference between the two programs. How high does that one go? Mm -hmm. It goes up to 500. Right now, it, look, it says it's running at about in the high 200s, close to 300, <clears throat> which is the reading I got. However, when I plug my laptop into my 
Um, into my modem, I'm going to see here if I can find. There's a. There is a. What is a sorry, I'm stumbling here. There was a place on here where I could. It kept a record anyway. Oh, I think it's right here. Right there. And if I scroll down, you can see the 270 is the one I just, I just uh, did. Um, and you can see the upload speed is a lot better also. But if I scroll down in this list, I don't know if it's gonna, it's not gonna let me, I guess. Result history. History, right down here is number 17. 570 meg. That's the speed I got plugged directly into my modem. That's the download speed, 31 meg is the upload speed. I would say that's not too shabby. So I'm in the process now because my, my, the wiring I have in my house is going through switches that are uh, uh, 10, 100 meg switches. So when I plug in that way, I don't get this 570 meg speed. I get around 100, like the ones above it here, the 94, the 96, the 94, and at one point the 52, I don't know what was happening there. Um, so my plan right now is, and I already have on order, a couple of uh, switches to replace my 10 100 switches with, with gigabit switches. And I'll be reporting back the results of that after I test it, but I, I didn't get them in time. I, I, I still don't have them. I just ordered them a day or two ago. So I'm waiting to get the faster switches. I'll be interested to see, like out in, up in my office and in other parts of the house where I'm cabled in, what kind of speed I get and what kind of speed I get through my Wi-Fi. So anyway. What, what brand switches did you buy? The switches I bought this time are TrendNet. You can get, they, they're, uh, I've got one five port and one eight port and the two switches together cost me about 50 bucks. They're gigabit switches? Gigabit switches, yeah. Mm -hmm. The other ones I had, I, I couldn't tell you what they cost because there were switches that people gave to me. <laughs> you know, I'm in the business of, I'm still in the business of doing some consulting for a few people. And every once in a while you get into a business and, and they have something in there and it's not, it doesn't have the capacity, like a five port switch in a real small business. That might work for a short time and then they'll add more stuff. They, you know, they put more printers and then with uh, other things they add to the, to the network over a period of time, they need more ports. So you can piggyback switches or you can just switch, you can just buy a bigger switch. Now I'm prepared for anything in my household now because sitting in my garage is a switch that somebody gave me that's 48 ports. And I don't think I'm going to run out of ports in my house right now. <laughs> So actually, I, I'd be, I, I'm actually trying to sell the switch on, on eBay. But the switches I ordered are eight port, one's eight port and one five port. And uh, the reason I went with the five port is because it's in my office where I'm limited on space where I want to put it. What about so your I didn't, cables? I didn't want the wider, the wider space was just kind of taking up a little too much room or something, I guess. And so, Are you running Cat6 cables? For the most part, yeah. But the, the whole deal with cables, and I've, I've been a network engineer for quite a few years, and I've wired CAT6 cable in a lot of buildings. I have very rarely, very rarely on anybody's network can you approach gigabit speeds even though you're running CAT6 cable. What does help in some instances <laughs> is to run fiber optics. Oh. That opens up that opens up the bandwidth better than any wired uh, cable, even though they're rated at CAT6. Um, you know, that's a theoretical rating at, at gigabit speeds. Are they better than CAT5? I'm sure they are. Uh, but on a network where you're using computers, uh, it's, not like, it's not like you're always on the internet. That speed is like an instantaneous speed 
the gigabit speed. So you only see it for an instant because you've got, let's say you got 50 people on the network and everybody that's connected, your, your computer is constantly sending out packets across that network wire or through Wi-Fi. And so guess what happens? It gets congested. It gets little traffic jams going on. So your aggregate speed rarely, rarely do you get up to gigabit of true gigabit speed on a network where you've got multiple users uh, on at the same time. Because everything's traveling across that wire. You send a print job, you do a download, um, uh, you, you, lo you, you stream in some music, um, you do all those things. And if you looked at the, if you could actually see the packets on the wire, you'd see they're bumping into each other because there's packet collisions on there happening constantly. But still, with a faster cable or faster uh, uh, switch, it is faster because it recovers from those collisions pretty quickly. And uh, so, so when you ask, do I have CAT6 cable? Yeah, I do have CAT6 wiring on, uh, on the cable connections I have in my house. It, CAT6 cable used to be more expensive anymore. It's kind of, it's almost a standard. It's almost the de facto standard. If you don't say anything, you're likely to get, um, they have a CAT 5 point something that's faster, they claim, uh, but not quite CAT 6 rating. And now that you've asked the question, does anybody know what determines the speed of the cable? What's the difference between a CAT 6 cable and a CAT 5 cable? It's probably the dielectric they use around the insulation. I could see where that might be a factor. And the also factor, the length of the cable. I mean, you know. Yeah, but what more, I'm asking, what's the difference between a Cat 5 cable and a Cat 6 cable? One cat. More twists. Well, one, one cat. One, <laughs> more twists in the wire. That's exactly right. More twist in the wire. That's why Cat 6 is more expensive. It uses more copper. And you can actually, on some of them, you can actually feel a difference in the weight. If you have a long cable coiled up in your hand, one of each type, you can feel a little difference in the weight because there's more copper in there. Because mm. the twists are closer together. There's more twists per inch for Cat 6. Mm. So anyway, that's my story on speed test. Um, I've got a 16 port switch, 100 megabit. I'm looking to upgrade. Yeah, yeah. My 48 port switch is 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 a, is actually 100, but I've got four ports on the end. That 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 um, the switch manufacturer sells adapters for that you can plug fiber cable into. Oh. And those are gigabit ports. So so it's got four gigabit ports on it. Um, Four, I think just four. And, uh, and so if you're interconnecting switches like you do quite often in a business from, from one floor to another in a multi-floor building, if you run fiber, your network will perform better. And I don't care versus CAT6, uh, the limitation, one of the other limitations on copper uh, wire is the, the total distance that you can run before it starts to have an effect on performance. It's a lot shorter than it is with fiber. With fiber, you can run two, three, four, five miles, maybe longer, maybe farther, but you can run miles. With, with twisted pair, you, you're down to like a few hundred feet before it starts to make a difference. And I've seen them work, I've seen copper cables work in a longer distance than that. And I don't know what, I don't know how it's affecting the speed. I never did a comparison between you know, a cable that's uh, 300 feet long versus a cable that's 20 feet long. I, I, I believe there's a difference. I don't know how great it is. Okay, any other questions or comments about that subject? Okay. So this is another, this is just a non-computer interesting thing that I found. Um, I haven't been looking at the time here. Uh, 12.08. It's 12.08. Should we take a short break or should we keep going? Is keep this going. session being recorded? No. 
No. No, I, mine I, arrived I'll, about 20 minutes late. Uh, I'll, just, I'll send my links to Barry, and the links will be online at, at the website. Do you know how to connect to that? No. <laughs> Sorry, that was my phone. I should have muted it. Um, there's a website. It's called jvanders.com forward slash the word Barry, B-A-R-R-Y. And that takes you into an area where Barry posts all the, all the uh, bookmarks that I've used today. Say it again. J Vanders, J-V-A-N-D-E-R-S dot com slash forward slash the word Barry. B-A or B-E? B, B as in boy, A-R-R-Y. Okay. Are we sure Marianne is not recording it? I am not 100% sure, but she's not in here right now, so uh, she might be. She might have. She might have. She Locked might have restarted out with recording. I have a PC. She, I'm trying to upgrade to Windows 10, and I I ran into a problem. It didn't complete. Uh, did it go back to what it was to Windows 7? I went it went back to what I had. It Windows 8. Yeah, Okay, uh, I've had that happen before. I, I don't. I don't know of a universal cure when that happens. The one thing I do know, if in in the case of Windows Seven, if you don't have some of the updates that they have recommended that you that they tell you you're supposed to have, if you're missing some some of the updates, that's exactly what'll happen. Windows Ten will stop and back and back the installation. It'll back it up and leave it in as Windows Seven. But it won't do. It won't complete the update. If you or it won't complete the upgrade to Windows 10. That's what happened with me. So if you go back to whatever operating system you have, if you make sure you have all the current updates you can have in there, and and then try it again, if you want to. <laughs> you know. There's another way to do that. <laughs> Download the latest version of Windows 10. Install it. And then use the the uh, um, product code from your Windows Seven. Very true. Yeah. That will work. I, but it, that will work, but it doesn't save all your programs and settings that way. Well, that's that's I, true, but I eventually no. had to do that because using the Windows Seven, I, everything was up to date, and it still wouldn't up there, upgrade. Really? Yep. I've only had it happen once or twice, and I went back and did the Windows Seven updates. And I ran it again and it worked fine. So I haven't had the issue. There's always something with Windows, you know. Mm. If Barry were online, he would he would uh, he would tell you that the cure for that is to go to Linux or <laughs> Ubuntu. Um, okay, this next link is just uh, something that uh, is being worked on. Wow. This is the new Air Force One in, in design stages. And they have a new engine that's not just a pure jet engine. They use a fan jet coupled together with a ramjet. And if you're not familiar with ramjets, they have this characteristic. <clears throat> they used to use them to boost uh, the, the performance on propeller driven planes. They had to use the propeller to get the plane up and going at a certain speed before the ramjet would work because it needs a lot of air being forced into the intake in order for it to have any effect. You cannot take off with a ramjet engine because you don't have enough air coming in. So they use a, it's a hybrid type engine that they're talking about in this. And uh, it looks pretty sleek. I mean, this is just a, you know, a, a design, an artist rendering or something. Um, that's th that, that thing is 20 or 50 years away. Maybe. <laughs> oh boy. Have they led a I, contract? <laughs> however, if you've noticed in the news, there are several countries that now claim they have hypersonic aircraft that they can reach the U.S. in much less time than anything we have supposedly that can reach them. This is not, this is not brand new technology. This is a combination of two old technologies married together into one system. 
And I don't know if that's gonna take 50 years. It could. Chances of me ever having a ride on this thing is pretty slim. <laughs> I saw that they just graduated the first class of, of the Space Force. Right, yeah, so I saw now that. I, yeah. Now it's like uh, six people in a general, but uh, maybe they got yeah. pilots for it. And you gotta have that high ranking officer. Exactly, you gotta make room for high ranking officers. I just watched uh, for a second time. I rewatched the movie Red Tails. I don't know if any oh, of you yeah. have have seen that about these World yep. War II, the uh, the all black uh, squadron, Tuskegee Airmen, that weren't given much credit for being able to do much, and uh, it turns out uh, they were able to do a quite a quite a lot. They were able to be very effective uh, uh, combat fighter pilots, and uh, it's just. Uh, It was, it was just kind of interesting. And, and I noticed, and I don't know how true it was because it was a reenactment, of course, of, of World War II days. It's a fairly recent movie. And uh, what struck me as uh, uh, something I had never really thought about too much before was there was a scene where uh, five or six of these red tail pilots were on the ground. They were in town. They were going someplace to have a couple drinks or something and they get stopped by the all-white bomber crew that's already in a bar and they were walking by because they didn't want any trouble they didn't want to cause any problems they were just going to go on their you know find a place where they could uh, um, celebrate their victory uh, peacefully and they got stopped and one of the white officers came out and said, hey, hey, you guys, aren't you the red tails? Come on back here. Come on, come on, it's okay, come on. We, we owe you a drink for, everything, for the coverage you gave us. And uh, they were still apprehensive about going back, even though they'd had this, uh, it sounded like an invitation. I think they were sus maybe suspicious that it was just a ploy uh, to get them into a place before they beat them up or worse uh, or something. But it worked out pretty good in the movie anyway. So anyway, yeah, it could be 50 years, uh, could be never. It could be uh, the way the military keeps secrets in this country and around the world. This already could be in existence or a form of it could already be in existence under top secret conditions. Look at all the, look at all the reports we get of UFOs Unidentified flying objects. Well, they've never had anything better than a radar dot or fuzz, so I don't know. Well, that's right. That, you're probably right. It, the, any pictures they've had are not very clear at all. But it's pretty obvious there's something going on that they can't identify because of the way it moves or the speed it's moving at or the sound it makes or something. And I'll take go back to the 50s when Powers, when Gary Powers was shot down over Korea in a U-2 plane. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Powers was shot over the Soviet Union, yeah. not he Korea. Wound, he wound up in Korea. Um, so anyway, that plane, he was in an S what we now know as a Blackbird SR-71. Or no, 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 I take that back. Not an SR-71. You too, you too. Right, right, right. I understand. I made a mistake. Give me a chance here, Len. <laughs> okay. Before you, before you jump all the way down my throat, <laughs> let, me, let me finish my thought. All right. He was in a U-2 that flew higher <clears throat> than uh, any enemy aircraft could reach at that time. So they, or they thought. How many of you had heard of a U-2 before he got shot down? My glasses. Nobody, unless you were in a top secret military uh, base and told not to talk about them. In fact, even in the 60s, after his incident and, the, and U2s became more or less public knowledge, I was at a station in the Air Force in Texas. We had a U2 land at our base. I don't know what he was doing there. Don't know what the reason was. They never brought him into the normal maintenance area. They posted guards around. Even those of us that had access to the flight line were kept away 
and this was in the mid 60s. So I could not guarantee you right now, I wouldn't take a bet that this plane doesn't already exist in some form and is already capable of flying at these speeds they're talking about or very close to it. I can't prove it. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just saying logically, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see this news. You wouldn't see this article about it unless some work has already been done and probably closer than you think in terms of completion. That's just a guess on my part. So. Well, I have read articles that the US military is testing hypersonic missiles that right. go around Mach 7 or, you know, the Russians claim Mach 15, but. Right. But but you're what you're saying here is a is a is a you know a, a big airplane a, a commercial uh, size airplane which is another category. Well, but, I don't I can't tell from this picture if it's a commercial size aircraft. Maybe it is. Well, it it's supposed pretty, to be Air Force One. It looks pretty big. <laughs> no, but but there's no rule that says air, the new Air Force One has to be a 747 size airplane. No. Uh, well. You know, the, anyway, support staff, the, the support staff that needs to travel with the president, there might be a couple that have to be with them on a flight like this. The rest of them can leave ahead of time and meet them there. Or they've already got pe people stationed there that, that, are, that are qualified and have the clearance to, to meet and, and secure him. I don't know. There's all kinds of possibilities. Anyway. It makes a good, uh, I guess it's uh, a good subject to uh, uh, create some conversation over. So, okay, so. This is back on computer stuff. I found, this is another article. Um, it, it does a comparison, you, you know, you, you see these comparisons in some of the PC magazines that are comparing the Intel Core chip to the to the AMD the Ryzen chip, and right now the Ryzen chip seems to be a little bit ahead in the in terms of the speed and the number of cores it has and so forth. But you don't see many comparisons comparing that Ryzen chip against the Xeon chip. The Xeon chip for quite some time now has had extra capabilities that none of the Core 7, Core 7, Core i9s, none of those have the capability that some of the Xeon chips have had for quite a while. I think it, quite a while ago in one of the meetings I brought up the, the issue of, uh, you know, you get intermittent problems with, with PCs, even though they're pretty reliable most of the time. <clears throat> but the systems that large networks run on, excuse me, <clears throat> the servers and everything that most big networks run on are all powered by Xeon chips. Why would that be? Well, there's a type of memory called error correcting memory, referred to as ECC memory. You won't see it in most PCs. The only thing that you can reason, you can buy at a halfway reasonable price <clears throat> HP and Dell and IBM or Lenovo, they have a class of machines they call workstations or engineering workstations. Some of those come equipped with a Xeon chip. Many of those also have the ECC or error correcting memory, which is not supported by the core I chips of any, of any number so far that I've read. So no core I5s, I7s, I9s. I don't know if there's an I10 yet, but they're probably working on that. But none of those support the error correcting memory. And in fact, my ex personal experience has been if you try to plug error correcting memory into a PC that does not have a Xeon chip, you won't even get it to boot because it'll start beeping at you. It'll let you know it doesn't like that. The hardware does not like that kind of memory unless it's equipped to handle error correcting memory. And if it doesn't have a Xeon chip, Supposedly, it's not equipped to handle error correcting memory. So that's one thing the Xeon gives you. The other thing the Xeon chip gives you is there are servers out there that have two or more CPU chips in them. Guess what that does to the number of cores in the Xeon chip? 
it doubles it, of course. And so that's another thing that you don't see multiple CPU chips in any of the core, the iCore machines. They don't know how to, uh, they're not engineered to handle that because those chips, and you have multiple chips in there, the, there has to be some level of coordination between what each chip is doing at any given point in time. So, so this anyway, this is a comparison. And the, the answer is, which is better? It says, are Intel's expensive CPUs worth a premium? The answer is, it's a definite maybe. It depends on what you're doing or what you want to accomplish with the equipment. If you're doing a lot of high level graphics, CAD work and so forth, the Xeon chips, even though their clock speed is a little lower than the latest i9s, the i9 chips, and even probably some of the i7s probably have a little flash, faster clock speed. They don't have the number of cores and they can't put multiple CPUs in one motherboard. So that's some of the, that's some of the differences. This article, if you're interested in reading more about it, uh, it, it goes over some of that and it, it tells you that um, um, there are some advantages to the Xeon chip. There are some advantages to having an i7 or an i9 instead of a Xeon chip. Uh, so that's why I say the answer to it, is it worth the extra money? It's a definite maybe. I can tell you from personal experience, I had a situation one time where an architect, uh, an architectural firm in Troy they were doing, um, in fact, this firm had been um, contracted um, by EDS to design a lot of the Saturn dealerships. That was one of the projects they had. And being architects, what they like to do is they like to present 3D color renderings of, of their idea to the customer before they build it, which means you have to create it in a graphics program, usually AutoCAD, because that's what they use for their design work most of the time. And uh, so um, they were having a problem. They had one, one computer. They took their fastest computer at the time, which was, uh, oh, back in those days, that was 10, 10 years ago or so, I guess. So, so it was probably like an i5, maybe a core i5 or something comparable to that. To do a rendering, a 3D color rendering of a Saturn dealership, would, would that job would run on that PC for a couple of days before it produced the results. And the guy that owned the company, he said, he came to me and he said, that's kind of unacceptable. He said, he, he said not only will we have to dedicate a machine, but he said, we have to set it up and then we have to wait, wait, wait. And then if there's a change, we make the change and then what? We have to wait, wait, wait again to re-render it. So what can we do? <laughs> So what I told him was, I said, I can buy you a machine that will be a lot faster. It's going to be expensive. Where he was paying about a thousand dollars a workstation for his normal PCs. This one was about 4,500, not including a monitor. And you want a big monitor. If you're going to do this rendering, you want nice, a nice big wide monitor to show off your work. And he was okay with that. He said, yeah, well, let's do it. So I ordered a machine that had dual Xeon processors. It had 32 gigs of RAM and what else? That's about, that, 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 that was the core difference between that and the normal PC he was running. So as soon as we got it in, I got it in, got the window set up and running and everything. He runs that same rendering job that took a couple of days and it finished in 30 minutes. That's the difference between running dual Xeon chips versus a single i7 or i9. Even though they have a faster clock speed, the extra horsepower that the, and extra channels and so forth that the extra chips that these chips provide make a huge difference in the overall performance. So the specs don't always, don't always tell you the true story. You almost have to try this stuff before, before you actually do it. And I knew how to do that because it was it had been a trial and error thing in the past that I'd solved for another company. So anyway, that's an interesting article uh, from How To Geek. Um, those of you that are interested want to dig into it, this would be a good place to start, I guess. 
So uh, let's see, I'm looking for, um, okay. Let's go back, this is a history lesson here. Let's see if I can get it to come up. Let's try this link here. Well, this is about the chips that IBM used to make, and they probably still do. Um, I'm going to hold up something here. Can you all see this? Okay, I'm holding in my hand. Yeah. Uh, this is um, what IBM called an SLD logic board from a 1964 System 370 Model 145 mainframe. That's not a big mainframe. The number sounds impressive. A, uh, a 145 was kind of like the lower end of the mainframe classes they had back in the, in the mid 60s. And uh, I'm gonna try to get this other link to come up here. Um, oh, wait, I did it wrong there. There's a picture. <clears throat> now, this box back here, is the CPU. The front panel had I don't know, about 150 blinking lights on there that used to make customers raise their comfort level that the machine was actually doing something. Some of the later mainframes didn't have anything like that. They were just, you had to, you had to trust that they were busy doing something based on the output that you would get. And instead of a CRT for the console, this little object right here that I'm circling with my mouse is, is basically a Selectric typewriter. <clears throat> that was the output console on 370s back in the days. And so they were noisy. You know, they chatter away like, like a typewriter does, except a little faster. And uh, to the right of this mainframe box here is this double wide panel, the blue doors on it. That was the RAM for the CPU. That had a whopping 512k bytes of memory in it. Wasn't using vacuum tubes, was it? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Vacuum tubes were a long time before this. This was using this little board that I held up, this little circuit board I held up. This, this machine was full of those. And by the way, that board I held up held about five megs of RAM. So it had a lot. And... Um, this little machine over here, if you don't recognize it, card that reader. is a combination card reader, card punch machine. Yep. So <clears throat> if you needed to make up a, a, a card deck for a program, one side of this machine would punch the cards, you'd feed the information in, you'd run the program, and it would punch up a set of cards and you'd keep them. And the next time you wanted to run the program, you'd go over to the other side of the machine, probably over here, <laughs> You'd load the stack of cards in there and you'd tell it, you hit one of those green, green button on the side there, that would tell it to go and that would load the program into, into RAM and then it would run. In order to store magnetically, these devices over here were the disk drives they had back in those days, one of the types. These little things on the shelf over here were the removable disk cartridges that fit in these machines. And the way you did a backup was you'd, you'd come over here, you'd take your backup cartridge and you'd put it in maybe the lower machine down here. And then you'd tell the system to duplicate, to copy this down to this one. And then you'd take it back out and put it on a shelf or you'd leave it in and take the original out, put it on a shelf as a way of testing to make sure that the backup worked. So you'd run your programs off the backup. And there were companies that did that um, daily. They had people working all night, switching those, switching those cartridges around and running these programs that all it did was make backups of what they had run in the daytime, I guess, or something. And so these boxes over here, the white with the white doors on them, you can see the little black area right there. That's where the disc cartridge sat. You could look through the plastic there and you could see them. You couldn't see much, but because it was 
it was uh, um, what tinted dark, and the and the and the platters spun so fast you couldn't tell they were spinning with the naked eye. They they spun those packs up at uh, at 3,600 RPM most of the time, and the way they changed them is they'd hit a button and that whole drawer would slide out, and then the lid would raise up, and then you had a plastic thing that fit on top with a handle, and you'd unscrew, it was screwed down, you'd unscrew it with that handle and then pull it out, put it on one of the shelves over, over on the side over here, and then take one from there and then put that in there and then screw it down. And uh, so it wasn't really automatic, as you can see. Um, but this was in the 60s. This, I think this machine was made in, uh, I think it was mid 60s, 64, 65, something like that. And this was a small mainframe, by the way. The big mainframes had these cabinets. They had more of them, and they were they would they would build them out. Like if you can imagine three dimensionally out behind here, they'd have rows of these big cabinets with more RAM and other circuitry in them. And uh, and so that's that's our history trip for the day. Hopefully, it's not something anybody would really want to go back to. I don't believe. No. <laughs> Okay, how many of you know what the Windows timeline is? How many of you have ever seen oh. a Windows timeline? You mean for end of life? No. Oh. No, not end of life. The timeline for its current things. Oh. Hmm. So, okay. So I think it's worth talking about. It's not very complicated. <clears throat> Windows Timeline keeps, keeps a list for you of current system activity over the last few days, maybe. It probably depends somewhat on how much memory you have uh, in, in your PC and, and the kinds of things you're doing. Um, so I'm gonna open this link and uh, the Windows 10 Timeline and how do I use it? Now you see this big blue area here it's got all kinds of little things on it that sort of look familiar. I can open my timeline, by the way. All I have to do is hold the Windows key down and hit the tab key. And there's my timeline display. If you look, these are the things I've had open in the last little while. Mm. And I can go back to those just by clicking on them and and it goes back to that window and opens it back up like immediately. If I need to go back in time, I can come over here to this little slider where it says now and that's the current thing. I can slide this down. And there's a history of all kinds of things I've had open all the way back to July 31st. How do you get to that again? The Windows key and the tab key. Hold the Windows key down and hit tab. Windows and tab. The tab key is like left end of the keyboard, the third row down on mine. Mm -hmm. Hold Windows, the Windows button down and hit tab. Oh, Windows and the Windows button. And the tab key is where? Mm -hmm. The left end of the keyboard above the caps lock key on mine. It, well, says, tab, it. it says tab on it. Just hold them both down. Hold the Windows key down and just touch the tab key once, and you'll get. You should get this similar display here. Oh, I see. Uh oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. I just lost you. No, you didn't. You didn't lose us. This is just another desktop that comes up over the top of everything. So if you hit the escape, you hit the escape key, it'll go back. Where's the escape? Upper left on the key on my keyboard, upper left, the very top left button. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, okay. So so you can maneuver back and forth. So you can have and, and I find this handy because I keep I have a lot of tabs on my thing. I switch back and forth between things. I don't always remember what tab I had opened on up on the top line on my main window. I can easily get back to recent things just by coming to here and clicking on one of those windows or 
if I want to create a new desktop, you see up here in the upper left, there's a button there. Yeah. You can open a new desktop and do whatever you want on there. Really? Really. Oh boy. Yeah. Think about that. There's a there's a keyboard shortcut for opening uh, more desktops. I forget what it is offhand. I think it's Windows Shift and the letter D or something like that. Or it involves the Windows key and the letter D and one other key. I forget which one it is, but um, with the Windows and Tab key, I don't read. I, I don't really need that anymore to navigate through the different desktops that are open. And it, isn't uh, there? A, it, there's something on the task uh, task bar on the bottom right next to the uh, your search box that you click on you get you can add additional desktops right that's another way that's another way i think it's that this is um the task view is the same thing right there it looks like a little looks like a little slideshow moving up and down when you hover the mouse over it exactly and i just clicked on it and i got the same screen click on right. it again I like keyboard shortcuts though, Len. You know, I, I've talked about that before. I have a jitter in my hands that I can't always control. And doing a keyboard shortcut for me is usually faster and works better, just works better than trying to get the mouse on some little thing to click on. For me, if you don't have that problem, then- Not uh, yet. <laughs> mouse, well, that's good. That's good, but you don't. You I'm don't a mouse want person. Yeah. So anyway, that's the timeline. And uh, there's a, this, this screen here, it has uh, some tips on how to use it, how to access it, um, how to do a few other things with it. Um, so, um, and you can see, here's a here's the thing here. They clicked on the, on the yesterday. It says, see all 19 activities. So it stores a lot of stuff right there for your immediate usage so you don't have to go back on the main screen and find like like i said like with me if you look at the top of my screen here look at all these tabs i have open and, and to tell you the truth to, to do the presentation today i closed a bunch of them see i can scroll back and forth a little bit and i do have a problem sometimes getting back to the tab i was looking i was working on before so i find this timeline thing to be um very beneficial in my case anyway. So if you've never seen it before, something new to play with and- uh, Says you can sync them across your PCs. That's your what family. it says, yeah. <laughs> so I don't have any more to say about that. Anybody have any more questions about it or comments? That's pretty cool. So, um, oh, and I have a link down here too. Get help with the timeline. That, that's kind of a Windows help thing. And uh, so. When should we expect these tabs to be on the Berry page? Oh, probably by this evening or tomorrow. Okay. I appreciate that since yeah. I, I got here 20 minutes late. Today's my first time. My name's Dennis. Well, hey, welcome, Dennis. Dennis. Well, I didn't recognize you, but I wasn't sure if you were a first timer or not. I am, and I'm pretty excited to discover you guys. <laughs> well, there are, oh. there are a lot of all the links since we began are out there also. So yep. you scroll down. All when sorted. Did, all sorted by previous years, and uh, I, I, I already went to the Berry page. Uh, Okay, so you oh, saw that it goes back a number of years. So you've yes, been, it does. Yeah, yeah, he's been doing that for quite a while, and uh, that's the the server space where that resides has all been provided by Jack uh, Vanderschreier at his expense. That's his that's his website that he he allows us to use, which I think is very generous of him. Yeah, that's how is Jack doing? <clears throat> I haven't heard. I talked to Barry briefly a couple times last week. He hasn't really talked about Jack. Um, okay. We're, we're, we're trying to come up with a different place to store all that. And, and I've talked to Mary Ann here at the OPC about it. And, and she's kind of busy these days with all the stuff going on that she has to keep track of. 
but uh, it sounds like she would be willing <clears throat> to give us a, enough space on the OPC website. And I think all they have to do is authorize it through the right, the, whoever's, who's ever maintaining the OPC website. It's some company somewhere. I don't even know who it is. Um, Are you an OPC employee, Dan? Or no, Dan? no. You're a volunteer? I'm just a volunteer. I was in the, I joined the computer club a couple years ago. I've, I've been in the computer industry just since 1967. And uh, so that's what I've done my whole life. I don't, I've never done any other kind of work other than, other than build, test, install, uninstall, sell, lease, everything with computers. Very good. So it's been my, it's been my whole, I guess it's my whole life, the way I, the way you look, you can look at that, but <laughs> you know, kind of a boring life sometimes. No, no, no. Uh, it's always oh. changing. That's true. That's the one thing about it. We always say the only thing constant is the change. Yeah. And uh, we've got some other people. It looks like they're talking. I can't hear them. I don't know if they're muted or what, what's going on there. That's a video. Oh, that's, that's, that's probably a video I have. Yeah, it's running. So... I don't have too much more today unless there's more questions or if you want to, you want me to go back and. Hey, Don, I was wondering why, I mean, there's no reason for, especially since Marianne is not going to uh, be doing anything. Why, why aren't we going back to the 10 to 12? Don't You'd have afraid. to ask Mary, Marianne, there was a scheduling conflict with the room or something. And uh, the have, link, yeah. You'd have to check with Marianne on that. She's okay. the one that made the change. She didn't ask anybody or tell anybody about it that I'm aware of. She just made the scheduling change. Mm -hmm. I know it's not, it's not as good because we have to work through our lunch hour. <laughs> <laughs> my lunch hour anyway. Yeah, yeah right. Right. And if my wife were sitting here next to me, she could tell you my dinner bell's ringing right now. My stomach is rattling. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Oh, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how that came I have about. a question. You said you're right now at uh, OPC. Is that right? Yes, I am. Why, why did you do that? Well, uh, just for the proximity to, um, to the connection here. And yeah. I, I don't have a place in my house where I can, uh, I, I don't have a place that looks organized enough. Well, I'd be, you guys I would be appalled if you saw the background that I would have if yeah. I was at home. <laughs> I presented last week and uh, I couldn't bring up the links. And before that, there was some chatter. So Marianne did it for me. So right. yeah. you're better off. Uh, you're better off being where you were. I didn't know that was an option. Yeah. What you have to do is you, you call her. What I do is I come into her office and I'm set up in her office right now. They have, she has an extra network cable and stuff in here and power cords and all that stuff. Nice. And, and she made enough space on this one desk area that I could set my computer and, and my mouse and, uh, and my water. Okay. And, uh, and there's no phones ringing and there's nobody talking in the background. Now at <laughs> home, I don't have many, I only have my wife and she doesn't talk. She's, she's actually, she keeps to herself. She's pretty quiet most of the time. Mm -hmm. And if I were doing something like this specifically, she would make sure that she didn't do anything to interfere or interrupt. Um, but um, I don't know. I guess it's just, uh, it's just my comfort level, <laughs> I guess. But this okay, is where, but, I, this okay, is where I'm supposed to be see, to do this. Did, did she open up Zoom and then you logged in or what? Or are you... Correct. She, she sets up, up Zoom and you log she in. Sets up the meeting and then I log in and then she makes me a host or a get well yeah a host. A so I have a little more or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm debating. I mean, the way you presented it worked pretty well. Uh, whereas Don Ledwith last week had all kinds of issues. So I know, I know. And I'm on next week, so I, I'm. I guess I will probably try to do the same thing. 
Well, if this now, is the first time you're Zooming, Len, I would suggest coming in because Mary Ann knows what she knows. She knows more about the Zoom thing than I do. She's helped me a couple well, of times. Well, I'm going to I was planning. I had I looked at there's Zoom tutorials and I want to look at a couple of those to see if I can do it from home. But if if not, I, that's not a bad idea. Well, you can I, do it. You can do it from home uh, because uh, because uh, Don did it. The other Don, Big Don, he did it from home last week. And um, yeah, but Marianne yeah, problems, right, Don? Marianne had to click on all the links, but I, I think the difference between what Don did today and what I did is, I was presenting off links in a PowerPoint, and I guess that added some overhead, which made made it difficult. It didn't, it, it didn't a, bring up the links. That's a possibility. And somebody else mentioned, I think. They, they put everything into a PDF document, put all their links in a PDF document, and then they use that to click the links. And yeah. that's okay. I, I mean, it, I, it sounds like it worked. I mean, it looked like it worked, but um, this seemed to work pretty good. I, this is how I did it the last time I presented also, and it seemed to go pretty smoothly. Um, okay, the last time you were also at her desk? Yes. Okay. Okay. She invited okay, me. I, I, I told it. her last time, I said, I've never used Zoom. I said, you know, you want us to use this? And, and she says, oh, it's easy. I, and I told her the same thing I just said, well, uh, earlier in the meeting, yeah, everything's easy if you know how. <laughs> but I had, I had never actually used it before the last time I presented. And so I had a couple of little things that, that happened that I didn't know how to back up from. And, um, and the same thing happened today. When I first started, uh, I, like when you guys talk, it brings up your little picture in the one corner of my screen where I have the window parked. So as you start talking, it, it, I see you as you're talking. I don't see anybody else that way. So initially when I started today, I had a little window like that for myself because when I held up something, I wanted to see what you guys were seeing. And I did something and that window went away and Marianne's not here right now. And I haven't figured out how to get my, the window of me back. <laughs> So, now, so, well, right now I've got one, two, three, four, five windows open. I see myself, you, uh, Carlos, Don, uh, Carlos, and uh, Dennis, and Donald Ledwith. I don't see anybody else unless that's, right? well, there that's are probably about it. That's probably about it. No, there are some participants. There was a total of ten. Yeah, there are people who are not sharing video and not putting oh, okay. the mic on. So there's a, there's a little right. key on the bottom of the thing, the little arrow. When you click on, yeah. you see other people. Right. Where's, where's the arrow? At the bottom of the, uh, at, guess, you know, at the bottom of the array of windows. There's, if you go to the bottom, there's a little arrow, and you click on, and you see more windows. Oh, okay. But see, as as a presenter, I don't see all those windows. Okay. I only see one window at a time. Yeah, me too. And uh, so, uh, and I like that better because I have more screen real estate to, to. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. How do we get rid of all these windows? No. Let's see. Well, Len, if, if you're if you're coming in, if you're planning on coming in and doing it from here when you present next week. Yeah. Give Marianne a call. And and tell her you want to come in and practice. Because she, oh. the first time I presented, I did do that. I went in uh, a day before, oh. and I set okay, up. Okay, but, but hey, listen, Don. I just noticed at the top of that array of windows, there's uh, there's some icons, and there's a single bar. When you switch that, everything goes away. And then there's one where I see myself. No, I see the you, the speaker. Then there's a two, and I see a whole bunch. And then there's there, and then and so there's stuff there. Everybody yeah, but I don't see that. I don't see that window, Len. I, I don't see that at all. Say, Glenn, what are you seeing at the top? Oh. Well, if you go to the, t if you put your cursor to the top, you see a bunch of icons, a single line, a, a, a more double line, and so on. If you click on the single line, everything goes away. Yep. But I think and if you're sharing your screen, if you're sharing your desktop, I don't think you have access. I'd have to stop sharing or minimize it, then I might see it. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, right now I only see Don, the speaker, and uh, if I click the, the multiple ones, then I see a whole bunch of windows and, okay, so I'm learning things right now. <laughs> yeah. I would, say, I, I would just suggest maybe setting up a practice session. Marianne would be happy to do that and come in and just do a quick practice and run through of what you want to do. You don't have to do the whole presentation, but just learn a little bit more about the controls and what you can do and, and so forth. I, I, I think it would help. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good idea. Because once I start sharing my desktop, what you see takes over my whole screen. And if I minimize that, it doesn't put me back to where I have the controls you're talking about. So there's, there's a difference between being uh, uh, joining the meeting as an individual and hosting the meeting, I guess. Okay. I, I'm going to go back and watch some more of those, those tutorials also about Zooming because there's probably a lot we don't know. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you, Don. That's it. We got, it's about, I got about five minutes to uh, one. And like I said, my dinner bell's ringing, so I'm ready to go to lunch, man. So hopefully we'll see, see you all next week. What, what determines the scope of what you guys talk about? We just, it's up to us individually. We just pick things. And there's rotating speakers? Yes, yeah. There's, I've had a couple of times where I had to do two weeks in a row because people were on vacation, but normally it's once a month. Or less. Yeah, next week, I'm going to talk a little bit about some Windows stuff and also about VPN. Okay. I, I use VPN. I use ExpressVPN. Oh, cool. Okay. I highly recommend it. <laughs> okay. VPN. I, mean, uh, I, I noticed uh, that uh, Firefox is, uh, I'm sorry, Mozilla is offering it, but there are other, they're limited now, and there's some issues there that, uh, some of these other ones are, are more. It's not that expensive. I was going to ask, is that ExpressVPN, is that a free one, or do you have to pay? And how it's much do you have of, to pay? It's one of the more expensive ones. I pay $100 a year. Oh, that's not so bad. No, it, no. It's worth no. It. it. It works extremely well, and I've got it on all my devices. Really? And why how, did, many why devices you, can, uh, how many devices can you, uh, does it allow you to connect? Five. Five, and, yeah. And yeah. If, you, if you set up, if you use a VPN enabled modem that they have uh, by different manufacturers, everything you connect through your modem is protected by that VPN. It only counts yeah. as one device. Okay, you have what is again? Express? Express VPN. Okay, let me look at that. Yeah, it might be worth looking into. <laughs> The article, a couple of articles I read says, don't go with the freebies. Yeah, you don't, you don't get any ads or anything. I mean, um, I've been used, this is my third year of using it. Okay. Why did you, what, what caused you to start using a VPN? Um, I torrent. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, um, the security company yeah. uh norton yeah they have a vpn now they don't allow you to torrent yeah yeah well maybe so you should talk about the uh, vpn <laughs> okay hey i wanted to share a couple of things for lynn since you're going to present um mary ann said she would record the meeting and put it on the opc uh youtube site if you want. And she did that for me. Uh, however, I got a link from her that said uh, I, she made it a private link because of language. As far as, <laughs> as far as I know, the only language fault was words that started with B and ended with S. Later on, right. uh, yep. later on, horse was horse was the one. So you've got to, I guess you got to watch your language. I was not given any guidance. Yep. So watch, I, she she, she I, mentioned that she mentioned that to me today before we started the meeting. Uh, okay, well, I guess she's getting the word out, but I, I didn't think it was that offensive, and I wasn't using it in an offensive manner. But 
anyway, so that's, that's words of the wise, but you can have it recorded and you can ask her to put it out on the YouTube site. God, uh, but two hours on YouTube. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, maybe she breaks it up. I don't know. Well, the files, she said the files are really big that she's done that with. Yeah. And, no, and the other thing is, Don, Don, I've heard your, heard your phone ring. Uh, if you haven't, go out to YouTube and look at Wartime Radio Review. I think you'll like some of the singers and things. They do a tremendous boogie woogie bugle boy. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay, Don, all right. Don, uh, you said you were a network guy. I might be interested in talking to you in the future because I do video editing for my church at home. Yeah. And in I do a lot of uploading and downloading and the files I download are on the order of 20 gigabytes in size. And mm. I'm doing at least between a half a terabyte and a terabyte a month. You're keeping up with, um, I think it was Amazon, I read about years ago, four or five years ago, and they said their problem with keeping up with stuff was that they were adding, they had to add one terabyte a week to their storage farm, to their, their server farm. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a one? That's my phone again. That's, I can name that song, <laughs> tune in three notes. That's the lunch whistle. Oh. <laughs> That's the lunch. Thank you for doing this. Oh, sure. No problem. Hopefully, maybe maybe you could uh, present some stuff on VPNs at some point. You seem to know quite a bit about them. It'd be, yeah. Uh, it'd be in information. Oh, yeah. It'd be useful. Okay, I'm I'm signing out. Okay, Lynn. We'll talk to you later. See you, Lynn. Who was it? That was... Here. I'm signing out also. Okay, Carlos. Have a good weekend. Yep, Have a you good too. Weekend. Yes, we're done. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Don. Okay, let's see. Guess I'm gone too if I can find the button. All right. Okay. Five dollars. See you later. All right. Oh, uh, Dennis. Oh, whoops. Okay. Okay.